So last week I, I was thinking about E.P. Sanders' um, very famous study from 1977 called Paul and Palestinian Judaism. Uh, and it's nearly 40 years old, so I thought it would be a nice time to dive in and start uh, thinking about celebrating its 40th birthday. And, and it has had a huge impact on Pauline studies. Many people claim to follow the lead of, of Sanders' study in 1977, and uh, a growing number of scholars are, are expressing their doubts about Sanders' project. Um, what Sanders said back in 1977 was the predominant understanding of Paul in New Testament studies uh, uh, into the 20th century was a, a Protestant understanding of Paul. Uh, and it, this, this Protestant view of Paul considered, attributed to Paul, the Reformation works faith antithesis. So the Reformers particularly, uh, the name, I mean, Luther is particularly associated, but the Reformers uh, had found a works faith antithesis, that is righteousness by works is seen as this rather futile and prideful human error of trying to seek favor with God through one's own efforts, whereas they found in Paul an advocation of justification by faith, and Luther added, by faith alone. And so uh, Protestants have attributed to Paul a works faith antithesis at the heart of his theology, and through this lens, uh, Protestant New Testament scholars have tended to see Judaism as the antithesis of Christianity and as a, a rather mechanical, moribund, legalistic religion of works righteousness. And uh, Sanders came along and said, well, in fact, the center of Paul's thought is not at all this works faith opposition. It's actually the notion of a mystical participation in Christ, whereby the believer transfers from a state of sinfulness into an opposing state of being saved and righted or justified. And when one searches the Jewish literature from that period, one does not find this legalistic works righteousness that has traditionally been uh, attributed to Judaism by these Protestant scholars, but rather a religion of grace. And so Sanders concluded, Paul did not, hi Sean, Paul did not reject Judaism because he found it antithetical to Christianity, Sanders says he simply found Judaism incompatible with Christianity merely because everything is incompatible with Christianity because Paul's Christology is exclusivist. If one is in Christ, it is the only way to be saved and no other possible way of being saved is, is uh, compatible with that. So Sanders concluded Paul didn't have a problem with Judaism. Uh, Luther did. So I wanted to pick up this idea that most commentators over the centuries, I think, and, and many still, uh, consider that Paul is rejecting the Jewish law. He's certainly negative about the Jewish law. He says it can't save uh, in many cases. And many are happy to state that this rejection of the Jewish law as a means of salvation is a rejection of Judaism itself. They see Paul pitting one religion against another. Um, and so when Sanders came along, he said, well, Paul didn't, Paul didn't find anything wrong with Judaism in itself, but he still ended up rejecting it simply because uh, salvation is Christ, in Christ is a, an exclusivist category. Um, and last week we also mentioned that while I think the majority of scholars have traditionally seen Paul's letters to Romans as the most complete and comprehensive uh, expression of Paul's theology, um, Sanders and Heike Raisinen, who follows him, say it's not a particularly coherent argument, 
Paul is in fact struggling on the page with some deep theological problems and some deep conflicts in his own thought. For example, God is good, God is faithful, God gave the law, but now it turns out that the law cannot save and Christ saves, so has God abandoned his people? Has God abandoned the covenant? These are conflicts in Paul's thoughts. So Raisin and, and Sanders see Paul struggling on the page rather than writing a sovereign theological treatise, but nevertheless, they see Paul expressing his, his own thought in the most comprehensive way that we have. Um, now, I want to delve into Romans a little bit more because my, my contention last week, which I could only briefly outline, was if Romans is supposed to be Paul's argument to explain what the law was for if it wasn't for salvation, Sanders isn't terribly different from traditional scholars in this respect. Um, he has differences in emphasis, but ultimately you get the impression from um, uh, most scholarship on Paul, I think, that Paul, as a Pharisee and as a Jewish person, used to think that the law is meant to save, but now he has had revelations from the risen Lord. He realizes that Christ saves, and now he has to work out what the law was for in the first place. Um, so most people would take Romans to be Paul's most extensive and comprehensive attempt to make an argument about what the law was for in the first place. Uh, Galatians is also considered to be about roughly the same sort of thing, but it's more ad hoc, more polemical and less uh, calm. So, so Romans is seen as the key. Um, but my point last week was, well, it seems to me that if Romans is supposed to be an argument to explain what the law was for in the first place, it's a very odd sort of an argument. Uh, it's, it makes sense to people who have grown up in the Christian heritage, uh, because we've sort of, whichever heritage we're from, we're more or less infused with the idea that Christ is the way to salvation and ancient Judaism somehow had it wrong. Um, so if one is reading Romans from, well, even after probably the second century CE or certainly the third century CE, Romans sounds like a perfectly decent uh, argument about what the law was for. It wasn't to save, it was to highlight sinfulness, make sinfulness known to human beings, um, uh, reveal their own hopeless state of inescapable sinfulness that comes from Adam um, and an argument that comes up more in Galatians to act as a kind of a schoolmaster uh, or a pedagogue to keep people constrained in the law until Christ might come. Now this is all very satisfactory for people um, instilled with the Christian heritage but we also, since, certainly since the 1970s, uh, because since the 70s we've abandoned the idea that uh, most scholars have abandoned the idea that Romans is an abstract systematic treatise. It's still written to an audience in first century Rome. This audience is generally assumed to be made up of Jews and Gentiles who have faith in Christ. But they're not part of the Pauline network of churches yet. They're probably worshipping Christ in a synagogue where Christ has been proclaimed. So we take it that Paul is writing to a group of people, Jews who know their own scriptures and their own heritage, Gentiles who are interested in it and aspire to that heritage. Romans is a very peculiar argument then to explain why the law was given in the first place if it's directed to Jewish people in the first century who know jolly well why the law was given. It was given as the condition of covenant membership. God says, I elect you, Israel. Uh, you are my covenant people. I expect you to remain holy. I know that you will fail discreetly, individually and corporately. Therefore, I have provided these means of atonement. 
I require you to do my law. Um, if you accept this, you can stay in my covenant. This is, this is why the law was given, but this answer simply doesn't, there's not even a hint of this answer in Romans. Um, Paul, Paul says that, as I said, the law was given to highlight sinfulness, um, to, to, to constrain uh, people until Christ should come. Uh, he, he does hint that the law, well, he certainly says the law is good and holy and just, but he also uh, says in Romans 7 that people's efforts to keep the law are sabotaged by sin as a kind of personified cosmic agent. So uh, people's attempts to do it are, are, are sabotaged by sin. So my problem is, as long as we were still viewing Romans as an abstract theological treatise written in a Christian paradigm, it made perfect sense. But the moment we really take seriously its historical context and any plausible audience we can imagine Paul writing this letter to is a completely inadequate um, sort, of a, sort of an answer. Now, on my handout, I've given a, a very idiosyncratic little outline of how Romans is often read. Obviously, I can't do justice to all of the ways that Romans has been read, because it's been read many, many times over the last 2,000 years. But I think it is recognisable to see Romans as partly an account of how Christ saves and what the law was for, if not to save. And Romans 1 to 4 is often seen as Paul setting up first a statement of how Gentiles are in a hopelessly sinful state, but Jews too are also in a hopelessly sinful state. So Paul is generally seen in chapters one to four as trying to level the playing field. Um, Jewish people who, or at least so I, I need to take the, 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 the warning of Jonathan Gorski from last week, actually. I mean, I, I, we talk about what ancient Jewish people thought. We don't know the great variety of what all the Ju ancient Jewish people thought. We only have the texts that are preserved to us, and these are canonical texts in general, and they are normative texts in general. So they are written by uh, Jewish elites who want to tell audiences what Jewish people ought to think. But nevertheless, the texts that we have at least, so ancient Jewish people immersed in the Hebrew Bible and the rabbinic literature, um, have tended to see Gentiles outside of the covenant as pretty much inherently sinful because they are marred with idolatry. Um, idolatry and sexual immorality are the, are the two big uh, uh, problems with Gentiles, and they are the two uh, things that Jews within the covenant must avoid at all costs in order to be able to remain within the covenant. Uh, one can make lots of slips and mistakes in the covenant, I think, and in, the, in, in obeying the law, but if, you, if, if, if a covenantal Jew continues to uh, get embroiled in idolatry, sexual immorality, and bloodshed, murder in the land, then sooner or later they will be ejected from the covenant. And this is, this is a sort of a quite recognisable Deuteronomic uh, situation. So Paul is seen in chapters 1 to 4 of Romans as showing that not only Gentiles in a hopeless state of sinfulness, but also Jews, even though they have the covenant and the law. They all are in the same state. This takes us up to about 320. So Paul has headed his letter halfway through chapter 1 by saying, um, the gospel is the power for salvation to all who believe, first to the Jew, but also to the Greek, for uh, in it the righteousness of God is revealed into ever-increasing faith. Uh, so he starts his letter with a fairly positive tone. The gospel is the pro proclamation of God's righteousness for salvation of those who believe. And he leaves out... Um, 
in chapter one of Romans, this notion that salvation is not from the law. He only, adds, he only gives the positive statement in Romans one, uh, salvation is from, through faith. But having gone through chapters two and three, Paul has got to the point where he has explained that all are under sin, Jew and Greek, and finally in 321 to 31, he can add the negative part of his statement uh, justification and therefore salvation come through faith in Christ and not through the law. So chapters 1 to 4 essentially are seen as Paul levelling the playing field and showing how Gentiles and Jews are in the same plight therefore they need the same solution and the law is not that solution Christ is the solution. Um, now Again, I, I add Sanders and Raisin in here because it's been traditionally seen as a perfectly cogent argument. Gentiles need saving, Jews need saving, the law can't do it, Christ does it. Sanders and Raisin say, yes, it is a meant to be an argument of that kind, but it is actually not cogent, it's a rather bad argument. But it's still an argument attempting to show that nevertheless. They say, Paul does not actually think from plight sin to solution Christ he thinks backwards he's dogmatic he knows what the solution is it's Christ he now has to infer backwards what the plight must have been and realize realizes that the law could not be the solution because if the law was the solution then Jews wouldn't need saving through Christ so Paul reasons backwards so they say Chapters 1 to 4 is actually not a very good argument because he doesn't really successfully show that Jews need saving um, in Christ. His, his, uh, this fictitious Jew that he creates as a dialogue partner in Romans 2, 17 to 29 um, is really a parody of a sinful Jew. I mean, it's, one can't really take seriously that they were constantly robbing temples and committing adultery and blaspheming uh, God among the Gentiles, left, right and centre. So it's a sort of a parody to show that Jews could be susceptible to sin and therefore if they could, they are, that sort of thing. But despite this difference on whether Romans 1 to 4 is cogent or not, all agree, Sanders and Raisinen included, that Romans 1 to 4 is meant to show that Jews and Gentiles are all in the same state. So then, when Romans 5 to 8 come along, Paul drops the distinction between Jew and Gentile. It disappears completely from his discussion. And as I mentioned before last week, and this would really require more argument, um, but I think it's a justifiable thing to say. Romans 5 to 8, I think, are read particularly in light of the body of Galatians, which itself is read through the lens of 2 Corinthians 3. This is a problem in itself because Paul sent neither Galatians nor 2 Corinthians 3 to Romans. So if we want to understand what Paul meant the Romans to understand, we shouldn't be doing that. Nevertheless, that's really another, <laughs> another issue for another day. So Romans 5 to 8 now simply seems to talk about the human condition and this bifurcation of, the human, uh, of human beings into two types, Jews and Gentiles falls away completely and now and also the talk of individual sins that we saw in Romans 1 to 4 falls away and sin with a capital S uh, a cosmic agent something like a demonic force appears uh, so whereas we had some references to individual sins in chapters 1 to 4 now we've just got sin as a force with a will and an agenda. And death appears as well, as, a, as an agent. And again, all the talk of Jews doing the law, which was common through chapters one to four, Paul continues to distinguish Jews from Gentiles through chapters one to four, and nine to 11 actually. Jews are people who do the law, Gentiles are people who don't. Jews are people who have the law, Gentiles are people who haven't. Five to eight, that all falls away as well. And the law stops being a thing that Jews do to stay in the covenant and becomes law with a capital L. A third cosmic agent which has 
uh, which, which um, impinges on human beings. Uh, people in chapter 6 of Romans are said to be under the law, some sort of state of oppression, and this is, uh, Paul expresses as equivalent to being under sin. Uh, the law is also something that sin sabotages in chapter 7. So, um, since Paul is negative about the role of the law in God's plan in Romans 5 to 8, it is generally assumed that Romans is, at least in part, uh, about why the law can't save. And uh, for the reformers, it's because the law leads to self-righteousness and pride. For Bultmann, uh, in the 20th century, it's because the law was actually meant to reveal sin uh, and thus Jews misunderstood its purpose. And this is what's wrong with Judaism. Uh, similarly, Dunn, actually, I think John Dunn re reinstates that kind of um, view, even though he claims not to. And for Sanders, it's simply because Christ saves, therefore nothing else can. Um, when we get to Romans 9 to 11, Paul seems to now be expressing his own genuine expression of fear for his own people. Uh, Israel have not accepted the Christ and he expresses his concern for them. Uh, again, a number of scholars, particularly since Sanders and Raisinen, have seen Paul really expressing his own struggle with the possibility that Israel has forfeit her privileges and that God's promises to Israel have failed. This, of course, represents another clash between some of Paul's core convictions. God is faithful is one of Paul's core convictions, but he observes that Israel have not accepted Christ. And yet the fact that Christ was always meant to be the means of salvation in God's plan is another one of Paul's core convictions. So Romans 9 to 11 are often seen as a, a locus of struggle for Paul where his own convictions are coming into crisis. By the end of chapter 11, Paul concedes that all Israel will be saved. Some people take this literally. Some people think that Paul has now redefined Israel as the church, uh, the new Israel, it's something that uh, Tom Wright does. So the true Israel. Uh, in any case, it's worth noticing that the saving of all Israel by the end of chapter 11 is contingent upon Paul's own Gentile mission. Paul's Gentile mission plays the key role in lifting the hardening that has partly come, on, come over Israel with respect to Christ. Um, this is a very important uh, point, which we'll come back to. Now, this... this this should sound roughly familiar. It's a bit of a hodgepodge of, of common ideas about Romans and what it's about. And I'm putting a lot of emphasis on the law. Um, of course, there's a whole lot more going on. So, for example, Kesemann, I think, is very, uh, import, has very importantly shown that uh, Romans is ultimately about God's cosmic restoration of, of the entire cosmos and all of these smaller issues uh, the law, Israel, Gentiles, anthropology in general are subsumed into this larger cosmic restoration. And that's all fine, but our focus uh, is on the law because it's been so much in focus in scholarly debate. I think actually it's a questionable assumption. Let's, let's state the assumption. The assumption is a very common assumption that Paul's gospel falsifies a common Jewish expectation about the law. That is, uh, Paul's gospel is often seen as a radical revision of the Jewish assumption about what the law was for. The implication in a lot of New Testament scholarship is Paul, prior to his commissioning by Christ, like all the other Jews, assumed that the law was to save. Now Paul has had to revise that view because of his revelations of Christ. Now Paul is saying to himself, if it is Christ that saves, then the Jewish expectation that the law serves must therefore be wrong. And I've put together a little catena of passages uh, which would seem to justify this view very rapidly. Uh, 
Galatians 2.16. A person is not rendered righteous by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.21. If a law had been given which could make alive, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But it is not, is the implication. Um, Galatians 2.21. If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died to no purpose. The corollary is Christ certainly did die to a purpose, so it cannot be through the law. Um, Romans 8, 3. Now God has done what the law could not do, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, etc. Romans 10, 4. Very famous passage. Christ is the end of the law, leading to righteousness for everyone who has faith. And, of course, this classic question in Galatians 3.19, why then the law? We might look at other passages which are becoming a bit more diffuse, but all seem to fit within this paradigm. So, the written code kills, but the spirit gives life, 2 Corinthians 3. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, yet thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And one can go on. But... My question is, do many, or actually any, this is why I'd be glad if Jonathan Gorski were here again, um, do any ancient Jewish texts that we're aware of really propose that observing the Jewish law saves in the cataclysmic, eschatological and eternal manner that Paul attributes to Christ? I've never come across such a thing. Maybe there is in a few apocalyptic uh, or eschatological Jewish sects, but even the Dead Sea sectarians don't seem to be saying, if we observe the law, then the cosmos will be uh, restored and changed and our bodies will be changed into spiritual bodies and we will inhabit the heavenly realms. And the, the, I've, I've not seen any texts where Jews think that simply by observing the law correctly, human existence and the cosmos will be rejuvenated in the way that dying and rising with Christ uh, allows a believer to die to the world and live to God. It seems to be an assumption uh, that's just grown up rather unreflectively in, in Christian scholarship because Paul seems to ask questions like, well, if Christ saves, then what was the law for? Christian scholars seem to assume that Paul and all other Jews thought the law was meant to do what Christ now does. But I can't see that. Um, another questionable assumption, which we see a lot in the literature, and we see it in Sanders and Raisinen, to reject the Jewish law as a means of salvation, which Paul certainly does do, is to reject Judaism. That sounds like historical nonsense to me. I, I said last week, and um, I, perhaps I'll have time to go into it in the discussion, Paul knows no two religions, one called Judaism, one called Christianity. First of all, he's got no word for Christianity or Christian. All he's got is those who are in Christ and those who are not. He does have a noun, eudaismos, which in Galatians 1.14 is always translated Judaism. You have heard of my former life in Judaism, Paul says, but it shouldn't be translated Judaism because Judaismus is a cognate noun from the verb Judaizim, to Judaize, which either means to, uh, for a Gentile to become Jewish, or when a Jewish person does it, from the books of the Maccabees, it means to protect proper standards of ancestral Jewish law observance. So it's not a religion called Judaism, which is distinct from a religion called Christianity. Those categories start making sense from the second, third, fourth centuries onwards, when rabbinic Judaism and the church define each other quite explicitly, antagonistically, as not each other. Rabbinic Jews were saying, we are not Christians, and Christians were saying, we are not rabbinic Jews. But this doesn't happen in the 50s CE. So the idea that Paul, say, Paul saying the Jewish law can't save 
is a rejection of Judaism is, first of all, an historical nonsense. The terms don't make any sense. And secondly, I'm not sure that Paul says that anyway. But I've given a few examples of quotations from people who take it to mean precisely that, so goppelt. Christian theology, it is said, will have to take Paul's theology of the law as its starting point and criterion. The letter to the Romans points out the solution to the problem of Christianity and Judaism, which is fundamental for the church of all times. Christianity is the abolishing fulfillment of Judaism. One can read a number of Paul's statements to mean that, but I don't think that Paul could have meant them to mean that. Um, what about Sanders, who says something similar? The law is good. This is on page three now. And even doing the law is good, but salvation is only by Christ. So far, so good. Exclusivist Pauline Christology. Therefore, the entire represented system represented by the law is worthless for salvation. I'm still on board there. Paul says the law is worthless for salvation. But now comes the thing which I put in italics. It is, the, it is the change of entire systems which makes it unnecessary for Paul to speak about repentance or the grace of God shown in the giving of the covenant. These fade into the background because of the surpassing glory of the new dispensation. Here we see 2 Corinthians 3, 9 being the key to Romans again. Paul was not trying accurately to represent Judaism on its own terms, nor need we suppose that he was ignorant of its essential points, that is, uh, repentance and forgiveness, he simply saw the old dispensation as worthless in comparison to the new. It's one thing to say that Paul saw the Jewish law as worthless for salvation, but does that mean that he rejects Jewish covenantal practice? Heike Raisin and some very, very stark ones, clearly Paul did not remain an observant Jew. Sanders has convincingly shown the inner logic of Paul's claim that no Jew will be saved as a Jew. No Jew will be saved as a Jew. <laughs> Jews as well as Gentiles must enter a new community. So Jews have to stop being Jews, according to Raisinen, in order to be Christians. Well, that is true from a time after Paul, when being a Jew is to belong to a religion which is incompatible with another religion called Christianity but I'm not sure that that is true in Paul's day. So, that will do for that. Um, so, who is this audience in Rome in the 50s CE where Paul can write a letter that explains what the law was for after all without mentioning the, 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 the essential Jewish doctrines of forgiveness and repentance, without mentioning that the law is a condition of covenant membership. And yet, Paul can still expect this audience to somehow accept this explanation of the law. Uh, I think Romans ends up, every, every way I look at it, Romans ends up being completely rhetorically incoherent if Paul is writing to explain to either Jewish Christians in Rome or Gentile Christians in Rome who know Judaism, um, why the law was given. So it seems to me more useful to try to construct a Roman audience who I think are plausible. First of all, Paul says all the way through Romans 1, 1 to 17, and all the way through Romans chapter 15, I am apostle to the Gentiles, I'm writing to you Gentiles. He says it so consistently that I think we should take him seriously. And every time he invokes a Jewish interlocutor in Romans, it is a a fictitious character to have a, a rhetorical discussion with. Um, in fact, I would say every time Paul addresses the Jewish situation at all in Romans, it is always 
in order to illuminate the Gentile situation and how his Gentiles should understand him and respond to the gospel. So we've got a group of Jewish Christians in Rome who have been introduced to the worship of Christ, uh, the worship of the Jewish God and to aspire to salvation through Christ. They are, they have picked this up in a Jewish community in Rome. So the Gentiles that Paul is addressing are among a Jewish Christian community. So what we need to do first of all is propose some of the assumptions that Paul and this Roman Gentile audience might have in common. Well, I would imagine that one, they assume what most of our Jewish literature tends to assume, that Jew, Greek, eudaios, it is an ethnic term, but of course the, the, the people whose homeland is Judea, the Roman province, have an ancestral um, deity and a temple. And they consider that deity to be the one true God and the creator of the universe. So Eudaios designates a member of the covenant people Israel. A Jew is by definition someone who has the law. Greek nomon echon, Paul uses that through Romans 2. And who does the law? Nomon poion, or phulason, or teron. A Jew is someone who is in the law, en nomo. Now, Paul refers to Jews being in the law at a number of key points through Romans. Unfortunately, it always gets translated as under the law in all the translations I know except the old King James. I think there's actually quite a difference between under the law and in the law. Jews are in the law, they're people who do the law. Assumption two, a Gentile who is someone who is outside the Israelite covenant. A Gentile is a non-Jew, and by definition, someone who is without the law, that is nomon me echon, who is lawless, anomos, and who does not do the law, nomon me poion. A Gentile is a non-Jew outside the covenant and is without the law. Assumption three, and these are all assumptions I assume Paul shares with his Roman audience, as someone excluded from the covenant, a Gentile is a sinner by default. This isn't an unusual thing to think because a lot of Jewish texts uh, suggest something like this. The Gentile state is by definition one of intrinsic sinfulness because Gentiles are outside the covenant. It is Gentiles exclusion from the law that makes them sinners. God's wrath is to be poured out against such sinners soon. Um, now, when, when, I, when I say they assume that Jew means doer of the covenant law, uh, Jewishness is defined by having the law and doing the law, they might all agree that there might be bad Jews who don't do the law well, who neglect it. Philo knows some, the Maccabees know some. But the idea is that the, the, uh, the, obedient, and, uh, the, the obedient, obedient covenantal Jew obeys the law. Um, where the Roman Gentile audience and Paul diverge is that the Roman Gentile audience, because they have been taught by Jewish Christians who are non-Pauline Christians, and in fact, this is, this is the view we see, I think, reflected in, among the Jewish Christian missionaries in Galatia as well. They typically, like Jewish writers tend to do in our literature, divide human beings into two types. You've got Jewish people and you've got non-Jewish people. That accounts for all of humanity in uh, lots and lots of Jewish texts. That, of course, would make absolutely no sense to the vast majority of people in the Roman Empire. The vast majority of people in the Roman Empire do not think of themselves as non-Jews, do they? Jews are just people who live in the province of Judea. Um, but by our period, uh, Jewish writers, 
all seem to have picked up this habit that I think they've got from Athenian Greeks a few hundred years before them of seeing everybody else other, Athen as a, other than Athenians as the Gentiles, the ethne. Jews have uh, picked this bifurcation of humanity up as well. So, and it's interesting that Paul can use this bifurcation of humanity without question when writing to all of his Gentile audiences. So he's writing to Gentiles in every case who are very familiar and accepting of this Jewish uh, human anthropological dualism. So now, the Jewish Christians, uh, who are Paul's colleagues, and therefore the Gentile Christians to whom Paul is writing in Rome, because these are non-Pauline Gentile Christians, they see the Jewish people as people who ought to belong in the covenant if they're going to be faithful to their God. Of course, you might get Jewish people who are considered by some Jew other Jewish people to be not in the covenant. But we are talking about normative uh, expectations. So good Jewish people who are faithful to their God are in the covenant. Gentiles are not only Jewish, Jewish ethnically, they are also by definition excluded from the covenant. Although we do get in, in the Pentateuch the inclusion of uh, slaves and uh, sojourners, don't we, into the covenant. They're excluded from covenant holiness. Um, I, I don't think biblical authors or authors like Josephus or Philo or the rabbis or the Dead Sea covenanters assume that Jews are simply holy unto God because they've been elected. They have to remain holy unto God by the discreet and continual doing of covenant law, uh, rituals when appropriate, when they're going to sacrifice in the temple. There is nothing wrong with being ritually impure in Judaism. There is something wrong with being ritually impure and walking into the temple. So that, that's a common, I think, Christian misnomer that there's something morally impure, morally wrong about being ritually impure. There isn't. Um, but anyway, Gentiles are excluded from holiness. Jewish people have the, op the chance to remain in the holy covenant sphere by maintaining the covenant. Now, non-Pauline Jewish Christians, and therefore the Gentile Jewish Christians that Paul is writing to in Rome, now perceive that salvation is contingent not only on being a good covenantal Jew and keeping the law, but also being saved in Christ, uh, presumably baptism, presumably some sort of faith in Christ. They had creedal formulas. They may not have been using the term faith in quite the same way that Paul does, because it may be his own special term. But nevertheless, uh, Torah observance belongs to both spheres, but presumably the early Jewish Christians and their Gentile converts considered Torah observance to be a prerequisite condition of salvation and then uh, being, it, it being uh, confessing faith in Christ or being saved in Christ as being the next condition. So for a Gentile, like Paul's Roman Gentile audience that he's writing to, who aspires to be saved in Christ, they're going to have to enter the covenant and be a Christian. Paul disagrees with them on some of these uh, Am I going to how do I close this? Does anyone know? Ah. Maybe if I I want to open my other slide. There we are. This is my homemade PowerPoint. Paul differs from them in some respects, but not all. He shares the view of the anthropological dualism. There are Jews and there are non-Jews. He shares the view that a good Jewish person ought to be faithful to the covenant God. He does not share the view, however, that to be saved in Christ is something that can only happen within a restrictive sphere of the covenant. 
Paul knows of two kinds of people with respect to salvation. Those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. A covenantal Jew who is not in Christ, I'm afraid, he thinks will not be saved. A covenantal Jew who is in Christ will be saved. It gets a bit ambiguous about Jews who are not very faithful to the covenant. Um, presumably, Paul would still consider a non-covenantal Jew who was in Christ to be saved. Um, but I don't think he has a great deal to say about that. But I think we can assume it because there are also Gentiles in Christ. They are not in the covenant, but they are saved. And of course, there are people who are not in Christ in all of the other areas. Now, we can argue about the boundaries there a little bit. But with, res with respect to anthropology, you've got Jews and non-Jews. With respect to who is saved, you've got those in Christ and those not in Christ. Um, Paul seems to be insisting, both in Galatians and in Romans, <coughs> that Gentiles may not adopt Jewish covenantal status. Not, don't have to, they must not. They're trying to. The Galatians are keen to get circumcised. Some of them have already done it. The Romans apparently too, although Paul's a bit more polite to them because he doesn't know them. These Gentile believers in Christ aspire to be saved in Christ and they assume they have to become Jewish in order to be saved in Christ. And we have Gentile, Jewish, Christi uh, Jewish Christian missionaries in Galatia telling them precisely that. Uh, and so that's presumably what the Roman Gentiles have learned as well. So the Roman Gentiles that Paul is writing to, they've certainly heard Paul's gospel because Prisca and Aquila are around and they are Jewish Pauline missionaries. They've come back from their expulsion after Claudius. And the, the Roman Gentiles are saying, OK, we, we agree that humanity is split essentially into Jews and Gentiles. And the Jewish covenant God demands covenant obedience from his people. We, we know that Christ saves Jews because Christ is the risen Messiah of the Jewish God and saves those who confess faith in him from the coming wrath of the Jewish God. However, surely Christ only saves Jews. This is what they're saying. Uh, surely in order to be saved in Christ, we have to become Jews. We've read the scriptures, we've had them read to us, we've been to the synagogue. God is extremely clear all through the scriptures. Y to be my people, to be my elect, you need to do my law. Our Jewish Christian friends have explained to us how the scriptures have always pointed towards Christ and how if we want to benefit from the eternal salvation that can be had in Christ, we have to become Jewish. And Paul is saying, no, no, no. We agree with each other that Christ saves Jews. And we agree that Jews are people who are in the covenant and who do the Jewish law by definition. However, I am writing Romans to you to, to, um, as an exposition of my gospel, which says Gentiles are saved in Christ as Gentiles. Jews are saved in Christ as Jews. Jews should not stop being Jews, but they sh should be saved in Christ. Gentiles should not stop being Gentiles. They should not aspire to become Jews. But they have to be, to be saved. They need to be saved in Christ. You get a lot of readings of Romans and Galatians which would propose that Paul is attempting to abolish Judaism and tell Jews that they jolly well ought to stop being Jewish and stop doing all their Jewish things and be saved in Christ instead. Whereas if you read Romans, it rhetorically only makes sense if you acknowledge that Paul meticulously 
from beginning to end, apart from the little section in chapters five to eight where ethnic distinctions disappear completely, he meticulously maintains the distinction between Jews and Gentiles, circumcised and non-circumcised, non-Jews and Israel, meticulously. And Romans 9 to 11 doesn't work unless they are meticulously distinct as a group. So Paul's good news is that Christ saves Gentiles as Gentiles. So when he writes in Romans 1, um, I am writing to you to, uh, what does he say? Have you got your Bibles with you? <laughs> Actually, I don't, that's falling apart, that one. Um, Paul, uh, uh, Paul the uh, Apostle set apart for the gospel of God, uh, which was pre-promised through, through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, uh, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and who was distinguished as son of God, son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness uh, by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul says in the very first moment that he's writing this whole letter to show that God has always intended to save the Gentiles as Gentiles. When he comes to Romans 1, 16 to 17 then, he is saying, for the gospel is the, in the gospel is the power of God for salvation to all, all who believe, of course the Jew, we all agree on that, but also the Greek. That, but also the Greek, is the contentious point of the letter. That is what the Roman Gentile Christians are very uncertain about accepting. They've got several worries about this. First of all, if God is now saving Gentiles as Gentiles without asking them to become part of his covenant people, then surely God is rather inconsistent and fickle. He spent the, all of the scriptures uh, insisting that his people must do his law. Um, that is what Romans 9 to 11 is about. Paul isn't worried actually himself about uh, whether or not the Jewish people are going to be saved. I think he's quite confident that they will be. But he's writing Romans 9 to 11 because his audience are very concerned about what seems to be God's reneging on everything he said through the scriptures. When Paul shows that Gentiles are in a terrible state of sinfulness and have been ever since the very beginning in Romans 1, 18 to 32, this is something that he and his audience all agree on. Yes, they say, this is precisely why we think we ought to join the covenant and be saved in Christ. When Paul then comes to imagining a parody of a Jewish person who robs temples and commits adultery and lies and steals and does all these terrible things, blasphemes the Gentiles. He is not trying to show that Jews do these things at all. He's asking, he's, he's, he's broaching the fear that his audience have. If Israel are not faithful to God, how does that impinge upon God's fidelity to the promises to the Gentiles? So their concern is whether the relationship, the faithful relationship between Israel and God, if that collapses, where does this leave the Gentiles? Where does this leave God's promises to the Gentiles, which he made through Genesis and various prophets? Um, so when, when Paul finally gets to stating that Jews and Gentiles are all under sin in Romans 3, 9, and then gives a catena of a battery of citations from Romans 3, 10 to 18. They are all sinful. There is not even one who is righteous. Their throats are open like asps and that sort of thing. These are all taken from Psalms, Isaiah, 
and from, from Proverbs, and they all apply to Jewish people. This is, this is, this is a battery of citations, not intended to show that all humans are sinful, but that Jews are sinful. This is part of his demonstration that the law doesn't save and therefore there's absolutely no point in the Gentiles trying to adopt it. And when he gets to Romans 3.20 and says, whatever, the, whatever scripture says, i.e. that battery of citations that he's just been through, it says to those who are in the law, this is Paul's consistent term for Jewish people, not only in Romans, but also in Philippians 3 and through Galatians. You will find it translated as under the law, which is a shame because under the law seems to express something else. This is the state of oppression that Gentiles find themselves in, excluded from the covenant. Whatever the scripture says, it says to those who are in the law, i.e. Jewish people, so that all may be held accountable to God and every mouth be stilled, for through the law comes knowledge of sin. This is not part of an argument that the law was only given in order to reveal human sinfulness. It is simply a statement that just as Gentiles can see from nature and their own conscience that they are sinful, Romans 1 and 2, 1 to 16, so Jews can see that they are sinful because scripture tells them so. Through the law comes knowledge of sin. This whole argument is an argument which is entirely directed to showing Gentiles why there is no point in them trying to join the covenant. It actually goes further than that. Paul is banning them from joining the covenant, covenant because it is not the Gentile privilege to join the covenant. We see at a number of moments in Paul's letters that he is still very proud of the covenant and sees it as a thing uh, in which he takes, he takes great pride in, this, uh, in his heritage. He bans Gentiles from attempting to usurp ancestral Jewish privileges. Now, these ancestral Jewish privileges will not save any Jews. Only Christ saves. And Christ does so in a dramatic way, which completely changes reality. But he still considers uh, the keeping of the Jewish law to be an important thing for Jews to do. And he considers it to be, and for Jewish Christians, he considers it to be a thing completely inappropriate for Gentiles to do, Gentile Christians. But both kinds of human being are saved in Christ. Um, there's, there's quite a lot more argumentation that would need to go on. You can, you're probably thinking of all sorts of passages which seem to undermine this, this thesis. Um, it's, it's got to become a book in the next couple of years. Um, I know it sounds like a bit of a cop-out to say there's lots of other things that I would have to argue <laughs> in order to make this stand up, but you really have to go through Romans and Galatians in particular very uh, sort of systematically and show how it all stands up. I think the, the, the final point that I would want to make is um, Paul presents himself as a model for imitation constantly through his letters, as the apostle to the Gentiles. Not only does he say imitate me explicitly in 1 Corinthians and in Philippians and virtually explicitly in Galatians 4, <coughs> he also, the, the pattern of his argumentation constantly sets himself up as the model of whatever he's advocating. So in 1 Corinthians 8 to 10, he asks them, to renounce their, privilege, their rights for the sake of the brother. And then in 1, in 1 Corinthians 9, he presents himself as somebody who renounces his rights for the sake of the brother. And in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, he asks them to curb their enthusiasm for spiritual gifts, which are divisive and lead to competition, and advocates love meaning that which builds up community and edifies. He then presents himself in 
1 Corinthians 13 as a model of somebody who exemplifies love as a means of building up community. So he, you can find it at every magnification in his letters. And if you read um, Abraham Malerba and various other uh, scholars of uh, Hellenistic Judaism and um, Hellenistic moralist, moralist writings, uh, writers like Seneca, uh, Epictetus, you, f uh, you find lots of examples of moralistic writers uh, using themselves as examples, as paradigms for imitation. It seems to me, and I think it can be shown, but again, that would be part of a book and a, and a completely different lecture. When Paul preaches his gospel to Gentile churches and when he writes his letters to these Gentile groups to, to which he writes, he, he writes as the model Gentile believer. He presents himself as the paradigmatic Gentile believer and says, imitate me, I am your model for a Gentile Christian. This doesn't mean for a moment that in his spare time he has abandoned being ethnically Jewish or covenantally Jewish. It simply means that he speaks as a Gentile very, very often in his letters. And actually, when, when you read Romans, he's speaking as a Gentile. When you read Galatians, he's speaking as a Gentile all the time by default, unless he puts up a flag and says, by the way, you know, you know I'm Jewish, and when I, when I speak to Peter at Antioch as a Jew, we, 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 we agreed this. Or when, when, when he puts his hand up and says, well, you know, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, and I, all this. He always flags up when he speaks as a Jew, but by default, the rest of the time, he speaks as the model Gentile believer, which I believe makes sense of a very great deal of what apparently is negative statements about the law. He's not, he's not saying the law should be abandoned by Jewish people, not, even, not by, by Jewish Christians. He is, we generally find him writing to Gentiles and explaining how the law determines the Gentile state of exclusion from the covenant and sinfulness by default. And so the law is really quite a negative thing from the perspective of Gentiles to whom he's writing. And since he's writing as the paradigmatic Gentile believer to be imitated by them, his statements about the law often come off as very negative. He's not actually being negative about the law in his, in his own reasoning. He's being negative about the effect the law has on Gentiles in determining their Gentile status in the first place and the role that the law plays in the Gentile uh, state. He also objects very strongly to any proposal that Gentiles must obey the Jewish law in order to be saved in Christ. And this accounts for most of the negative statements he makes about the law, actually. Thank you. Thank you.